I mean, I'm I'm blown away by 40 home runs. I'm blown away by 400 home runs because of how many he's hit in his 30s. This decade doesn't happen for most players. Does, does 400 still resonate in the modern era? Yes. Okay. Yep. For me, anyway, I, I can't speak I mean, for— Because I think it's 50-some players I read, right? I so can't speak for other millennials. <laughs> um, no, how many is it? It's like 56, I think he I might thought be 57. I saw something, 50, 50 ish something that he will with be— With 400? With 400. Let's see if I can find And there will be guys night. that come behind him who do get this. I mean, but it still means something to me, especially for guys— you're going to be breaking in. Yes, you're hitting with this turbo ball, as Trevor Plouffe calls it. <laughs> but, like, so? You still got to hit the filthiest pitching in human history. Yeah. You still got to hit 99 and turn it around and send it out the other way. You still got to deal well, with the fact that guys strike out 30% and, of the time. And he is 39 years old. He's 39. Too. And he's hit, I mean, he's hitting balls 480 feet, yes. too. Or, I yeah. mean, he's not scraping any fences. I am in awe of the career accomplishment. Probably a a little bit more so than the the this season accomplishment, but that's not because I'm not impressed by 2019. Like I, I was in the scrum yesterday talking to Nelson Cruz after he hit 38 and 39. His three run bomb not only tied the game yesterday, but it also set a runs record for the Twins. Another one as goes, a franchise. Another one falls down. It's incredible the the records that are falling. This offense is historically great, and I was just sort of. I know Nelson a little bit as a guy, just like in the press player way, you know, not like we're buddies, but I was in awe standing in that like scrum talking to Nelson Cruz yesterday with what he's doing at 39. He is, he and uh, Marwin Gonzalez Murph are the consummate pros, Uh which means they don't really have time for you. They're nice enough to you, but they'll throw you a bone. Yeah. And by the way, I love this. But they know they get every part of it. Yeah. Like they get how to deal with us. They get how to deal with teammates. They get and they they exude. And this is the okay, this is the thing that Kirk Cousins will never have. He wants it, but he can't get it. And he just won't. They exude that professionalism of it's gonna be okay. And I've seen guys, and if you try and and run that act, Brian Dozier ran the act. Oh, yeah, I got this. It's going to be okay. You're like, Brian, no, it's not. No, you guys are not good. You're falling apart. Brian, 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 listen to me. Uh, Nelson Cruz and Gonzalez, they exude everything that you would want. From media dealings to their at-bats to their interaction with teammates, all of that. And and I can't even give you the formula for it, but I sure know it when I see you it. You see it, you know, it's like pornography, right? <laughs> That's exactly I can't what define it, it, but I'll know what I see it. What the judge said. Uh, no, that, that's a, that's you just hit it. I could because I can't sit here and write it out for and you. With the whole Vasquez thing going on, maybe we shouldn't make porn references right sure, now. Sure. Well, and I'm trying to figure out what percentage of the audience gets the justice. What is it, Potter Stewart? Yeah, it's a Potter Stewart. Stewart. You know what? Nice, you, nicely done, sir. Nice work. And if you don't, Google it and find out because it's a great reference. It's leadership. Leadership. It's you a know great it, reference. You know it when you see but it. But it's true, right? And we're in the presence of it, it right you now. You feel it. Yes. You sense it. Yes. It's very different. It's like a vibrational energy from this dude. Corner locker. He took over for Joe Maurer in that spot. That was a— Oh, he's a, got the real estate, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh he's yeah, got, I guess he would. He's, he's got, got the cred to he's have got more, the real estate. He, he's, he's got more stalls than Joe had, right? At least as many. Joe had two. I think it's the same. I okay. think the corner locker guys get two of them. Okay. And Pineda, Pineda was a corner locker guy. I almost I half expected them to give that to somebody else, slide somebody over there. It's now a uh, it's still Michael Pineda's name played on one side and uh, lost and found on the other. So they've moved that because it's a crowded clubhouse. So they've got to like, get the lost and found. Locker. I like the lost and found. Uh, yeah, there's a pretty, metaphor yeah, in yeah, there somewhere. Is. Hey, you mentioned uh, another record that fell, right? Most runs in a season. The Twins have, yep. Can you explain to me, Judd? Because you were here, obviously, you know. How did the 1996 Twins score 880 runs? The line, the lineup was incredible. Mm-hmm. But they were the, awful, the weren't they? The pitching was off the charts bad. And think about that. I remember that lineup in 96. That was the spring that Kirby woke yeah. up with the, with the so dot he, he, on his left yes, eye. Yes, and he retired. They were going to. Okay, Murph. PK was going to throw out. Top three line, top three of that lineup: Chuck Knobloch, who hit 341 that year; Paul Molitor, who they had just signed in the offseason, who also hit 341 that year and drove in 113 runs. And then Kirby would have been the number three hitter, and was tearing the cover off the ball in spring, spring training, right? Yep. Yeah. I'm trying to find out if I can uh, if I can quickly scroll down here and see what the team ERA was because they oh, it was bad. They was for awful. The, they for the life of them could not pitch at all. But that team offensively. 
was a juggernaut. And that's the old AL West, so they would have been Texas? AL Central. Oh, it was, AL, it was Central. Old AL Central, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it was that that team that team could hit and could not had no pitching. No pitching. They had a team ERA of 528 that year. Oh, that's not very good. <laughs> and it's it not going to last smurf. long. Analysis. Yeah, and that's the steroid era too. That. So every game was 10 to nothing. Yep. Every every all five guys in, or I'm sorry, every member of the starting rotation except Brad Radke had an ERA over five. Wow. So what have we learned, guys? So when wow. when you when you combine what what um, Falvey and Levine have done in the time here, what have we also learned by going to school on them from from because their their way of thinking is obviously progressive, right? Yep. We all consider that to be progressive. They've certainly made some good moves. But the most interesting thing, and if I was to write a book about the Twins right now under this regime, it would start here too. The culture chemistry experiment that went so wrong in 18 and that they they clearly went to school on, like Cruz and, Mar- and Marwin being signed is not some, oh, let's just go get those guys now. They clearly went to school on that. I find it so in- interesting because baseball people now seem to have two schools of thought. The old school, get off my lawn, I hate you. And the new school, and analytics mean the world to me. And that's – and. And but the smart people meet in the middle. Yeah, I was going to say, say it feels like there's some middle ground. No, no, but I'm saying, but the smart ones do. But but you get but fan bases, you yes. get a lot of pushback of I listen to games on radio. I hate baseball now or or the younger set can be, you know, analytics mean this and that. But and I download the score North first place twin show on podcast. But what I love is the middle shrewd. See. I love the middle. I think the middle is so interesting because what we're seeing, I think, in 2019, I, to the credit, I, is I the totally, middle. I totally 100% agree with you. I, I think we – let's let's throw ourselves under the bus here for a second, Judd. And you and I were talking about this two years ago, two off-seasons ago. We were like, oh, uh, Logan Morrison, nice value buy, 30 bombs last year. Lance Lynn? Lance Lynn was one of the big four starting pitchers available on the market. You got him on a one-year deal for how much? We on and on down the list. Addison Reed, I really liked the move at the time. Every one of them blew up in their face. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Fernando Rodney, I guess you wouldn't say blew up in their face. But my point is we gave them aces for their offseason report card for what they were able to do in a down market, took advantage of it, and came in and got value. Good players. They were going to win some games. Fast forward, 2018 season doesn't go as planned for anybody. Lance Lynn was miserable, shipped out of town. Uh, they they bought and then sold, but Addison Reed had a bad year, coming off of really a great track record for a late inning reliever. I won't bore you with the details of the 2018 season; it didn't work. But to your point, Judd, they went to school on it. They took that and they learned from it, and they said, "Okay, maybe some of these like late winter guys, not exactly the value that we thought. Not not only performance on the field." But there are also other components of this that we've got to consider. And, I mean, fast forward again to the 2019 winner. Yeah, we were all frustrated at him for not going to sign Craig Kimbrell, for not going to get Dallas Keuchel or whatever. But look at how their offseason moves have panned out. I'm, I'm really impressed by them learning from it and then applying it less than six months later and, and coming out aces again. Well, and then the thing I, I – that. Look, I'm not as uh, I'm not as well versed in the roster machinations of the last couple of years, but I will. To me, it, look, we talked about this the other day. Molitor wins 78 games. He was on borrowed time, probably anyway. That's still a politically difficult move to make, right? We Absolutely. can all agree with that. Absolutely, shoving out the door with years on his contract, a Hall of Fame player and a local guy, a local hero. Yep. Um, who had just won AL Manager of the Year. Right. Who had just taken, yeah, a year before they went to the wild card game. So uh, to do that and then bring in an unproven 30, is he Seven. 37? 37-year-old yep. yeah. Rocco Baldelli. He's only two years younger than Nelson Cruz. <laughs> yeah. He's a- yeah uh, that's, you, you know, you got to have some strong faith in yourself and and where you're going yeah. with this. So I, yeah. Yeah. you got, I, I, to me, look, he's not the only reason they're doing this. Uh, he's He's learning on the fly as well, but he's he's been able to, as we talked the other day, uh, take a team that had raised expectations and played down to them last year and brought them in and managed through a ton of injuries and a bad bullpen situation. So uh, I think the the guts to make that move yeah. as 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 strategic as it might have been was politically uh, dangerous. Yeah, that 
require some capital and they uh, spent it. It was and, gone. And it, look, it looks like it worked yeah. uh, to me anyways. And that's coming from a guy who liked Paul Molitor an awful lot. Judd, um, I want to take this another step to the, ne to the next level of they didn't just learn from the chemistry, but the thing that strikes me about their offseason moves this year, and I'm thinking of three specifically. I'm thinking about Nelson Cruz, the ageless wonder slugger. I'm thinking about um, Jonathan Scope. And I'm thinking about Marwin Gonzalez. And the thing about those three guys is they targeted two of them early. Not that Marwin wasn't on a whiteboard in an office somewhere as, hey, he's a good player, no, a winner. He out there we like him. Nelson, Nelson Cruz was a target. Let's get this done. Got it done before. I think it was before Christmas. Right. That's the lesson, I think. J Jonathan Scope, same deal. Yep. Hey, you're a good player. You're seeking a bounce back contract, one year deal. Okay. Because then you can hit free agency and reestablish some value. We want you. You are valuable to us. Here's the number. Yep. And, you know, negotiations, let's get this done before New Year's. If you go somewhere else, that's fine. But we just want you to know that we think very highly of your talent, your abilities. We want you in our walls. They got those two guys done. But then they didn't just go sign anybody as, as the market continued to drag out and players were out there. Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, um, Craig Kimbrell, Marwin Gonzalez. They didn't just go sign anybody. There are other players that were out there too. But I think before bringing in a guy so late in spring training, they didn't bring in just anybody. They brought in, to use your phrase, Judd, a consummate professional and they, in Marwin Gonzalez. And they clearly, and what they hadn't done in 2018 that they did this time, and where I give them credit because I've seen, and Murph has too, people, executives in lots of sports, they vetted it very thoroughly. They clearly knew Marwin was going to come in. Everybody, yeah. I, I think they targeted Cruz because they realized the problem, in retrospect, um, among if you were to come up with the three fundamental problems that started the 2018 Twins season, one of the top three is they played rotisserie baseball. They got names. Oh, that name sounds, Lance Lynn, which is what we thought too, right? Yeah. Lance Lynn will be good. Good pitcher. That's rotisserie baseball, a name on a sheet of paper who should produce. It's fantasy now, isn't it, though? But they don't call it rotisserie. I think anymore. it's still rotisserie baseball. I, I'm not I haven't sure. heard it called that, but Judd calls it that, and I roll okay. with it. All right, I'm not go. sure. But anyway, the point being is, but Lance Lynn was not a good guy. He was not a good guy to yeah. have around. Yeah, and a and, and, it's, and well, Addison it's crazy. Reed was the same way. Nelson, I think that they ident I think Nelson Cruz ultimately was the main antidote to all of the problem people. And they said, because they had a good group. This group, I think, now is good. The issue is, if you keep bringing in bad guys, good groups turn bad. Good so, groups turn so, bad, and if you're on the fringe, you could go right. either way. So if you're a Rosario especially type, if you're rewarding bad guys with, with contracts, exactly. Right? So so now you've got. I would almost guarantee that Nelson Cruz a couple nights ago, when when Rosario didn't run on that uh, attempt to at triple. That he pulled him aside at least and said, "We don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, come on, bud." And Rosario might have said, "I don't care," you know, yeah, something it's... like that. But I think that he's, but you know, Nelson Cruz or or Marwin is the type of guy to step up and say, "Don't do that." Here. Maybe don't make the third out at third base with right. Miguel Sano coming up. I, I think I just think there are two lessons that they learned, and one is like act early. Don't string out these guys on the market and say like, sure. "Well, we like you, but we like you for this dollar figure, and sure. if we can get that to come down another four hundred k, our bosses will be happy." Yep. Stop. Put a value on a guy. If you like him, target him. Show him that he's valued. And they did that with Jonathan Scope, with Nelson Cruz. And then I think they probably had some uh, – you probably have to swim upstream a little bit. I don't, I don't know. I haven't talked with Marwin or Marwin's agent about this. But if you let a guy go into spring training, mm -hmm. I mean you're kind of tacitly saying, we, we like you, but we only like you at a number. Right then, you're a contract, and you're a, you're a hired gun. So what did they do? They did two things: the Sano stuff probably, or maybe forced their hand a little bit. They weren't going to have a third baseman. Brings up their valuation on a Marwin Gonzalez because the replacement level is lower. And then it's not a one-year deal. They gave Marwin Gonzalez a two-year deal and said, "We value you that much. We know you were out on the market, but we think that you're a a, a big component and asset." It wasn't. Suddenly, hey, for six months, you're a mercenary. Come on in and hit some bombas. Play, yeah, and play I, think, defense. I think it's it, when you tell players of their experience level and their uh, success level that we value you beyond what you can do on the field. 
Yes. Um, I, don't, I yes. think that still matters. I think that still matters to even veteran players like that. They want to hear that. They want to be looked at as somebody that can be admired and appreciated yes. uh, on an everyday basis, sort of for what they can do beyond uh, their talent level. As you we, said, not so much of a mercenary. We have, uh, we have a computer program that will project your batting average, <laughs> but we're not telling you we want you because you'll hit 265. You know, in the right. in but the, the part land. And the starting point for a team like this is clearly good players, but it's also, and this is what they got right this time. It's good players, but it's also chemistry, and it's also, you know, yeah. you can't just yeah. throw, especially baseball. You play on in football, it can be dicey, but it's sixteen games, and if guys fight, that's not good. But in baseball, it's one hundred sixty-two games. You're on top of each other every every day. day. You travel together all the time. You have to share Fenway's tight quarters. Yes, and eventually, you go on the you, road. and eventually, if you have guys saying, I, I didn't get mine, bleep you, I don't care about you, that ain't going to work. Yes, agreed. And, and it didn't work. And, and Or on the flip side, if you reward bad guys with big money. But, you know, Lance, Lance Lynn in Texas, I think, is now mildly happy, and at times well, that's this year crazy. was pretty good. He's but, so good this year. But I think he was – but he was legitimately – miserable last year here he signed late he wanted to stay in st louis he should have taken the qualifying offer from the cardinals which if i'm not mistaken would have paid him more than he made here in 2018 yes all but every one of those things every time that he did a a post-start press conference was reflected he was miserable and i'm sorry but if you put me with people especially in sports where i'm supposed to play off you and you're miserable every day and you hate your life eventually i'm like why are you even here but they got that right, and I admire that because we talk a lot about their thinking and the and w- what they bring new age wise, which they do. They're very smart guys. But what I really admire was they said our chemistry experiment really stunk, hmm. so let's fix it. And you start with Nelson Cruz, change a couple ingredients, and he's been incredible. Yeah, think I, about that. Nobody would say that. Nobody would ever say that Joe Mauro was a problem in the clubhouse. But it, he also was a guy that you know. He wasn't necessarily a natural leader. He didn't right. embrace that type role, right? That's right. fair. So he moves on out yep. uh, and takes his contract with him. You know, it's, it, it expires and it's over with. I'm not saying the culture changed because Joe Maurer is gone. Again, I'm not trying to pile on him. But it's fair to say that that he was never going to be that guy that was going to run through the wall for you figuratively. He supposedly, I, I was told this and I, forget by whom uh but he was he basically started to do the game ball thing last year because he he had grown tired of people trying to trying to lead who couldn't lead at all so he he recognized that yeah so he was tired of the act he was tired of guys being like i'm your new tory hunter well no you're not yeah there's one but but i will but i will stand by this statement guys like nelson cruz are born and and if they come into 21 and say my clubhouse guys are like, no, it's not, but they know not to, but you know, Kirk cousins and Brian Dozier. And I can go down a whole list of people who say, well, because I am, I am good at my sport. I I'm going to lead. You can't do that. You can't walk into any environment. It's just like a workplace. You can't walk in and say, I'm the guy. Cause if you do, you're not the guy I like love- Nelson Cruz. Walked, I guarantee you walk he doesn't say he's to Hammond guy. stadium and guys are like, Hey, it's Nelson Cruz. And he's like, yeah, that's right. Didn't have to say a word. Watch right. me. They're like, he's the guy. Correct. He doesn't say it. But no. you're bored. But that's a that's a gift. Yeah. Um. I love that this morphed into a conversation on leadership and chemistry. And Nelson Cruz has all of that in spades. He's also one home run away from 400 boys. Number 399 last night. He's 57th on the all time list. Do you want to know the names ahead of him coming up? Yeah. Yep. He's, yeah. Duke Snyder, Mark Teixeira, Alfonso Soriano, Daryl Evans, and Edwin Encarnacion, who's still active. Daryl so Evans. Daryl Evans. Billy Williams, former Tiger, right? Mike Piazza, Cal Ripken, Andrew Jones, Juan Gonzalez, Carlos Beltran, Andre Dawson, Paul Canerco, Jason Giambi, your guy Dave Kingman, Vlad Guerrero, Jeff Bagwall, Carl Yastrzemski, Adam Dunn, Jose Canseco, Dave Winfield, Chipper Jones, Carlos Delgado. Okay, he's going to retire all stop. the way? Oh, okay. No, that's those are, those are fairly How close with can the, you get them with those names? Can you, um, let's what, see. Where's 450 at? 450 is about where I stopped, actually. Uh, the the last name I read is 473, so maybe Delgado, he doesn't catch yep. Carlos Delgado. So, but, like, it, he's playing next year. He's got an option with the Twins. He's playing for they, $2 million less. Do you think they pick that option up next year? It's, no, you tear up that contract mm, and you give him more money. He's got a pay cut coming. <laughs> you, you tear up that contract. 
or you tack a year on. I don't figure it out. What are you going to take him to 63? Figure it out. Because somebody asked the other day, they asked Rocco, do you think he could get to 500? And it's like, you laugh at that because he's no, 39, do, but right? You laugh at that because he's 39, but also I would have laughed if you told me he hits 40 this year. Yeah, well, and the ball is wound tight as a drum, right? So and think if he wasn't really I mean, good. At, think if he wasn't kind of a late bloomer. Totally. Because Nelson didn't really start hitting a lot of home runs until he was probably, I think, 28, 29 years old. Yeah. was when he started to really come into his own yeah. as a player. Well, I got I it mean, for you here. His first year with more with double digit home runs, he was a 28 year old in Texas in uh, 2009. Mm -hmm. He hit 33, and then it's just been yeah, 33, 22, 29, 24. The consistency is 40, 40, 40, 43, 39, 37, 30, yeah. 39. What? You're not supposed to do that in your late 30s. No, it's true. TCL Broadcast Studios. Let's do this. There was a lot of good at Target Field last night. We certainly.